pleasure today to introduce our speaker today, Zalim and Sonia Akyan, College of Science and Engineering uh, Seminar. Distributional Modeling for Entities, The Case for Precision, uh, is our title uh, of our talk. Sebastian Pado is our guest, and so thank you, uh, uh, Sebastian, for joining us today. Uh, I'll give a, maybe a shortened version out loud of the description, and then we'll obviously uh, hear the real deal uh, in a second. So entities, like Mozart, are ontologically distinct from concepts, like composer. Distributional methods are very good for capturing fuzzy graded meaning of concepts. So for example, Italy is more similar to Spain than to Germany. But comparatively little attention has been paid to entities, which presumably calls for a more precise representation. Uh, so here we're going to hear from a couple of studies that, uh, that Sebastian's been involved uh, with, and he's you know, going to uh, a lot more detail. Uh, Sebastian Pado is a professor of computational linguistics at Stuttgart University in Germany. He studied in Saarbrücken. Saarbrücken. Linguistics people, it's like very uh, stressful because now I have to say all the words precisely. And Edinburgh, receiving his master's in 2002 in cognitive science and PhD in 2007 in computational linguistics. After a postdoc position at Stanford, he's professor of computational linguistics at Heidelberg in 2010, and now in Stuttgart in 2013. His core research areas concerns methods to learn, represent, and process aspects of natural language meaning from and in text. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Thank you very much for having me, and, and, and thank you everybody for coming in in the late afternoon on a very nice early spring day here. Um, the good thing about this, this nice uh, introduction that I just got is that you already can get around my first, my first slide, which was the first to, to introduce myself anyway, um, just to give you a rough idea of what, what we are, what kind of, uh, kind of a research context we are in Stuttgart. So in Stuttgart, we are one of these German universities where we actually have, a, have an institute that's kind of dedicated to natural language processing, where we do text-based research and speech-based speech research, so kind of going into, into the phonetics. Uh, thing and, and we have dedicated uh, bachelor's and master's pro uh, programs there and, and so I my group is is called theoretical computational linguistics although you shouldn't put too much weight on that particular name because the other group for example is called foundations of computational linguistics and if you ask yourself what's well, the difference between the foundations of something and the theory of something well I mean uh, it's mostly you know to convenient things to keep the department allow everybody to do whatever whatever they feel like doing. Um, so there is a couple of people people involved here. Um, and, and so the guy uh, whose work I will recall mostly today is the person here on the at the left hand at the left hand corner Abhijit Abhijit Gupta who was uh, who was a PhD student working working on this stuff here. And then uh, we have some collaboration with Gemma Boleda from Barcelona and Marco Baroni, who was at, at Trent when it's now uh, uh, Facebook, Facebook AI research and uh, you know, changing, changing the world, I guess. Okay, so, so um, what's, what's the background of the stuff that I want to be talk, talking about today? So the kind of general, general idea um, that, that um, a substantial part of my own research builds on is what's what's generally called distributional semantics in in uh, natural language processing. So that goes back to, to ideas uh, really from, from structural linguistics. And if you want to really go back into history, then you end up with some, somebody like Rousseau Steele around the turn of the 19th, 20th century. But the kind of let's say more more substantial let's say uh, initial initial moment was I guess with the kind of Structuralists of the 50s and 60s, like Burton Harris, who, who said that, well, um, you can talk about the meaning of words by observing how that word is actually used in, in actual conversation. I mean, that, that may sound trivial to you, but actually, if you compare it to kind of the more theoretical strand of linguistics, it's actually a pretty, pretty revolutionary idea that you should essentially have you know, dictate what words mean by how people use it. No, it's the language task to define what words mean, right? 
No, I mean these guys recognize essentially that um, that you know you can only in a let's say uh, I mean today we would say in kind of a practical and word coverage way about word meaning to actually look at the usage of, of words in, in communication. Um, you can also trace that back, for example, to Wittgenstein's philosophy of, of, of you who has said, well, what is a game? It's very hard to get a definition of game. Everybody knows what a game is, and if two people essentially uh, successfully use the word game in their conversation, then, then we can tell what, um, what that means. Okay. Now, from a computational linguistics or NLP point of view, the nice thing about, about distributional semantics or the distributional hypothesis is that it gives you a very simple um, and almost foolproof way of, of um, representing the meaning, the meaning of words um, if you have just, just a big chunk of text and you don't even need um, particular linguistic analysis of it. Um, so in the simplest case, what you do is, is you just you know, take a big chunk of text, for example, Wikipedia or something like this, and then you build a, what's called the bad of words model, which means you just you know, look up for all the occurrences of the words that you're interested in. You know, what other words do you see there? A couple of, couple of positions to the left or to the right. Thank you. So if you're interested, for example, in, in what you know, the usage perspective has to say on the meaning of individual country names, then you can look up what, what uh, for example, context Italy occurs, and you see Italy occurs with sunny, not so often with beer, Spain occurs also with sun and beer, with Germany it's just the other way around, right? So there is not so much the sun in Germany, but, but far more beer. Okay, so what's nice about this too is that you can also give this, the, this kind of vector representation that we have here, if you look at the column vectors, which you can then see as a representation of the, of the country names, you can also give them a, a geometrical interpretation. So the, the context words, the rows here in the, in the matrix, you can think of them as, as dimensions of a, of a high dimensional space, and then essentially the meaning of the word is just one point in this high dimensional space, and then you can talk, for example, about cosine similarity or any other kind of similarity measure that you, that you like in order to, to characterize which words are more similar, which words are less similar. And so here, for example, from this space, you kind of see one glance at Italy and Spain are uh, more similar to one another than they are than they are in Germany. Okay. Um, so to kind of come back, the idea is uh, the idea is that if you can observe the occurrences of words in, in a text corpus, then this allows you essentially to discover something about the underlying semantic similarity that is what you if that is what you and so, so this is something that, that quite a bit of kind of meaning analysis in computational linguistic um, builds on because it does allow you, as I said, to build large-scale uh, word representations um, in an unsupervised way, uh, and it kept, it has been shown to capture many different different aspects of word meaning. Um, as I said, you know the whole vagueness fuzziness issue. Um, you know, words have multiple meanings, also you can try and capture this distributionally as a kind of a clustering task, for example, and so on and so forth. And so, um, what, what's nice if you see computational linguistics mostly as a way of, of you know, doing linguistics in a, uh, in a practical and, and a computational way, then this allows you to explain or to, to give, give data-driven accounts of, of many uh, concepts that, that linguists hear about like you know, lexical relationships, like selection of preferences, like, like also even processing, uh, processing aspects like, for example, speed of effect. When you show people one word and then you show them a related word, then they, they recognize these words faster. This is something that you can also explain, explain relatively well here. Okay. Um, so people have done this, I would say, uh, roughly from the 1980s, you know, when <coughs> Where people started really also looking at looking at large text corporate competition linguistics in the first place, um, up until relatively recently, really just by counting, um, and then kind of the neo Lapo revolution came along, and, and not quite five years ago, uh, then somebody presented what is essentially the first uh, deep learning model of, of distributional semantics. But then the idea is, well, you're not just counting and putting those counts in the matrix. What you do is you learn an underlying model that then 
essentially you know generates the the observed uh, co-occurrence counts with a with a high um, with a high degree of or hopefully high degree of accuracy and on a mathematical level that doesn't really change the, the context because you can think of this more or less as a, as a kind of dimensionality reduction and that's about it okay so I would say I, I want to mostly abstract away from from that for the purpose of this talk so what are the problems then? This is not supposed to happen. This is what apparently what happens if you um, import a PowerPoint presentation into, into Keynote, but, but here we go. Um, so a well-known limitation of the distributional approach is that it tends to be kind of weaker on the precision side. So you learn a lot of stuff about a lot of words, but you can't really rely on, on, on all of this. Um, so, so uh, for example, distributional approaches find semantic relations when they are there, but they, uh, you know, this is just just really formulated the wrong way around here. If a if a distributional approach tells you that two words are semantically related, then you can be fairly sure about this, but they miss lots of lots of semantic semantic relations. And this is something that people different people have shown over the years. For example. You know, there was a very nice study in 2009 where they did a comparative evaluation of knowledge sources to find inference relations between words of, for example, a country is a location and a chair is a piece of furniture and the table is also a piece of furniture and the window is an opening and these kinds of, of hierarchical uh, inference relationships. And so, so what they did was to look at various, uh, uh, various computational linguistics resources, and without going into too much detail, you can roughly, roughly say that um, you know, these guys here at the, at the top of the table are ontologies like like Linux, which really are mostly hand-built and try to, uh, try to give you, um, try to give you, uh, <coughs> uh, And, and try to uh, mostly hand build and try to give you a very precise idea of 